Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to My Favorite Mistake. Uh, my guest today is Simon T. Bailey. He is a keynote speaker. He's a success coach, an author, television host, philanthropist. We'll talk about um, some of those different roles. He's worked with over 2,000 companies in 50 different countries. Success Magazine calls Simon one of the top 25 people who will help you reach your business and life goals. And so before I tell you a little bit more about Simon and some of his work, welcome to the podcast, Simon. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. Good to be with you. Well, I'm excited to hear your story. There's a lot we can talk about related to your latest book. Um, you know, Simon, tell you a little bit more about him, the author side of Simon. He's uh, the author of books, including Release Your Brilliance, The Four Steps to Transforming Your Life and Revealing Your Genius to the World, and his most recent book, Ignite the Power of Women in Your Life, A Guide for Men. So before starting uh, his company, Simon worked for the Walt Disney Company, including four years as a sales director for the Disney Institute. He has degrees, including a master's degree from Faith Christian University and three honorary doctorate degrees. So you can learn more about Simon at his website, simontbailey.com. And his book's website, the most recent book, is ignitethepowerofwomen.com. So you can look for links for all of that in the show notes. So, you know, Simon, gosh, of the, the, the different things you've done in your career, I'll be curious to hear, you know, when and where and how, um, what was your favorite mistake? So I'm sitting at my desk and uh, whenever you work at Disney, you never talk to the media unless authorized. And this journalist says, where do you see yourself 10 to 15 years from now? And I said, I see myself as the president and CEO of the Walt Disney World Resort and eventually the chairman and CEO of the Walt Disney Company. And he puts this in print. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the article comes out, Florida Business Trend Magazine, page 12. And my boss says to me, what in the world were you thinking when you did this interview? And I said, Larry, I work at this company whose motto is, if your heart is in your dreams, no request is too extreme for when you wish upon a star. It makes no difference who you are. Funny today, not funny then. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't appreciate that being kind of oh, no he didn't appreciate it at him. no <laughs> and to make matters worse i get a call from the senior vice president who was my executive sponsor and mentor and he reported directly to the president al weiss and he says do you need me to go to al on your behalf because this is really bad and i said how bad is it he was like simon if this article would have come out before the markets closed People would say, who's this guy that's in line to be president at Disney? And so I was like, no, don't go to Al. So <laughs> H HR shows up, asked me to sign a little piece of paper that went in my personnel file. Yeah. And Mark, let's just say Disney didn't fire me that day. But about a year later, I heard the footsteps coming and they were not singing. It's a small world <laughs> after all. <laughs> mm -hmm. <sighs> um, gosh, so there's a lot to unpack or dig into though. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll try to ask this in a more friendly or constructive way than you heard it at work that day. But Simon, what were you thinking? Or like, what? I mean, cause you, you, like you, like you stated, you, you knew probably to be careful. Was it, was it okay? Was it authorized to be talking to that reporter about something? Just not that? I, or? I was not authorized at all. My name was not on the Disney list of, to talk to the media. Mm -hmm. And when I look back now, uh, you know, it's just 20 plus years ago. I was, uh, it was a lot of ego, <laughs> a lot of ego. I was in my way. I was way over my skis. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And the, the, the reporter had found you. He found me. To, to talk I, about like, some issue related to, is this still related to Disney Institute? He wanted a story that he had to write. Mm -hmm. And he got my name and number calls my desk. I mean, you know, I'm like, heck, what the heck? Let's go for it. So. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. you you answered the phone and it was kind of spur of the moment as opposed to having time to think about it. Like sometimes a reporter will email you and say, hey, I would like to talk and you can process it. But like they, they caught you and boom, I mean, <laughs> they asked that yeah. question and you, and you gave him an answer. I did. It was it was a magical moment for me saying <laughs> I want to be the number one guy at Disney and not to think it through that he's going to put this in print. And it's going to come out. And then what are you going to do? Yeah. I didn't think it all the way through. Well, I mean, and to you know, to be fair, you 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 might have thought, well, if this isn't a profile piece on Simon Bailey, yes, maybe it's just a yeah. You know, you, you, I guess you would wonder, well, why are they asking me that? Sure, but they did, 
And uh, I mean, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, it wasn't a flippant answer. Like when you were thinking about career paths, this was a legitimate ambition or thoughts you were trying to figure out how to get there, right? It really was. And the outcome of that, I got a call from uh, a university here in the state of Florida who says, we just read the article. We want to invite you to come and be our commencement speaker. And I said, who who was your commencement speaker last year? And they said, oh, we had Secretary Madeleine Albright. I Uh said, "Okay, well, (laughs) I said, let me check my schedule and get back to you. Yeah, as long as they weren't framing it as future CEO as well. Yes, yes. But, yes. Um, so, so I mean, so th- that exposure in the article, it sounds like got you some additional exposure and opportunity at least. It did. It changed the trajectory of, of my future, mm. uh, literally. I, I said yes to the being the commencement speaker and was the youngest ever spoke for 10,000 people. And it just, uh, it kind of confirmed that, okay, I think it's probably a good time to leave the mouse house. So this is happening and oh gosh, I mean, that, I'm sure it's gotta be a time of um, rethinking goals or opportunities. You said it took about a year where was this sort of a gradual recognition of, Oh, my future here might not be the rest of my career. Uh, yeah, I'm, it was I'm a career suicide. Was. It was career suicide. I saw it. Yeah. I saw the handwriting on the wall. I said, it's probably time for me to exit out and create a strategy. So I put my resume out on the street, got four job offers, mm-hmm. uh, to an uh, internal move at Disney. One of the senior VPs felt sorry for me. Uh, two vice president's offers and a senior director position to head up all customer care for Learjet owners in the world. Hmm. And I, tur- I turned all four jobs down. I just said, you know what? I, I think I'm going to go for it and do my own thing. Hmm. So uh, yeah, yeah, decided to go in that direction. So one way or another to leave on your own terms instead of maybe, it might've been a different mistake of waiting until they put your head on the proverbial chopping block. Yes. Right? I mean, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um. So, uh, so gosh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing maybe, you know, for, for listeners to reflect on, for me to think about how, um, well laid out career plans in, in some sort of instant one way or another could really, could really change. You, you, you'd hope for the best. And it sounds like in your case, it really was, um, un, you know, unexpected, unplannable, but I'd, I'd be curious to hear more about that process then of, Putting yourself out there then, uh, starting up your own company and figuring out what to do and where and for who, you know, as an independent person. So one of the things that I realized uh, in my Disney career, they sent me to Paris in 1999 to do some work at Disneyland Paris with a thousand leaders from Barclays Bank out of London. And while I was there in Paris, Lion King had just come out and they wanted to learn leadership lessons from Lion King. And it dawned on me oh my goodness, the money is in content. It's in the intellectual property. So I said, if I ever go out on my own, I'm to, I'm going to develop IP and repackage it and sell it. So I, I had that idea in my mind and yeah. it, it started at Disney and that's what I decided to do and go for it. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have to consult a lawyer if you're going to use a phrase, if you're going to use a, a phrase like the Lion King or can you kind of dance around that? Yeah. Great question. So as you can imagine, Disney has lawyers, <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> lots of lawyers. Yeah. So I can tell my story of mm-hmm. what I learned as mm-hmm. a leader, as long as I don't use their proprietary information. So I can mention Mickey or Lion King, but I have yeah. to tell it around a story. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, I, um, I've never, I don't want to be in the sights of their attorneys, but I, re- I remember some Simpsons episodes where they would make fun of uh, of Disney and then insert a joke about um, being, you know, though we're going to get sued. But I think it's actually now, ironically, all I think all of that was now is owned by Disney. So yes. yeah. We'll mm-hmm. see if they go back and <laughs> they have a sense of humor if they to leave that in the old episodes. But that's uh, that's a little sidetrack there. So, <laughs> um, so I, so as you're you're focusing on content and and speaking and and writing and you know from your own experiences and of thinking of all the things to share was the most recent book um, ignite the power of women. Was that driven by personal experiences with women in your life? 
Yeah, it was driven by an experience. My daughter came into my home office and she said, hey, daddy. I said, hey, baby girl. And I sensed she wanted to talk, but I was emotionally clueless. And after a few moments, she just got up and said, dad, I'll catch you later. And I said, okay. And it hit Mm. me that I had missed a moment to connect with my daughter. So when I came back home, I said, Madison, you wanted to talk to me. And she said, daddy, it's okay. I said, no, it's not okay. Because if I don't change my behavior, you're going to marry somebody just like me. And her mother said to me, you give everybody the best of you and you give us the rest of you. And I don't want the leftovers anymore. Oh, gosh. So, yes, after 25 years of being married, Uh, We went through a divorce, and unfortunately, I had built a house but lost a home. I was chasing money but had no meaning, and I was pursuing status but really didn't have any uh, satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And so that mistake of not keeping the main thing, the main thing, family, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So that was a huge lesson, you know, for me to learn. Gosh, um, an unexpected bonus, uh, bonus, second mistake story. Bonus is not... uh... The right word to use with um, reflections on a situation like that. But um, so, gosh, so uh, thinking about relationships then with with uh, wife and daughter and mm-hmm. reflecting on that. I mean, so then how 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 did it seems like uh, it sounds like well, I'll just ask it. My mistake. Reflections on on that is is part of what then drove you and inspired you with the book. Absolutely. So uh, my divorce attorney suggested that I go and see a therapist and no guy wants to go and sit on a sofa with a therapist named Anita, who's been practicing for 40 years and has more degrees than a thermostat. And (laughs) Anita says to me, whatever you don't deal with will eventually deal with you. Mm. And what I didn't recognize at that moment, the book was already being written because I realized that I had messed up the relationship with my daughter, her mother, my mom and I were had a bit of a distant relationship, arm's length relationship, and I had to get that right. So I started writing after going to therapy and and doing the work to say, wait a minute, hold on, I got to share this story. Yeah. Well, and 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 I, I I appreciate you sharing. There's there's certainly it, it can be uncomfortable for people. There's certainly nothing wrong with going to see a, a therapist, and I, you know, I think people in recent years are more willing to talk about that mm-hmm. openly, you know, there's been mm-hmm. times, um, in, in, in my life or career where that's been helpful for me, like workplace situations of like, I, I need someone else to help yes. me figure out what's going on. Is it a me issue or it's usually, or sometimes a me issue, um, if you're, if you're taking these things seriously, but, mm-hmm. um, so thank you for, you know, for, for being willing to touch on that and, and share that. So, um, is, is, is the book when you talk about back to that title, it's an interesting phrase, ignite the power of women. Is it, so when you ignite that power of women, is that to be beneficial? Is, is it relate, how much is it related to careers or to life or what, what, what I, I'd be curious, maybe just first off, like what, what are some of the key lessons about if we have women in our life who are important to us? Number one, emotional honesty. Uh, women don't want to be controlled. They want to be understood. Uh-huh. And they want to know that you're going to come from a place of emotional honesty where you are okay admitting, I don't know what I don't know. That's the first thing. Uh-huh. Uh, the second thing is women want to know that you have the ability to communicate and connect with them not try to tell them what's right or wrong. Mm. So you're going to release the need to be right. Uh, And the book is for men and women to Mm. enter into a deeper conversation, looking at your career, looking at your life and relationship. Yeah. And, oh gosh, I mean, those things you said there are powerful. Um, Even just helpful advice in in workplace scenarios, admitting you don't know what you don't know, not needing to know everything. Um, so again, I think uh, whether it's personal relationships or workplace relationships, you know, it, it is a, a human tendency to want to help right the ship for others. Like I've heard psychologists refer to this as uh, the writing reflex, not like writing a book, but writing, writing the ship or like it, it's well intended, but it usually falls flat or worse is counterproductive. Can you tell us more about like your experiences of like, you're trying to be helpful, but it's not the right way to be helpful. Yeah, it's really coming down to the difference between authentic listening and selective hearing. And I think where I made the mistake, I would hear what I 
what I would want to hear. And that because I was a bit of a control freak, had a need to be right, I was not listening to what she was saying, wasn't listening to my daughter, wasn't listening to my mother. And I said, wait a minute, when I truly listen, I release the need to be right. Mm -hmm. And I become open to what wants to emerge and grow from that situation. And and that's that's really well said. And you know, I one thing I jotted down, you know, from your book was this phrase um, you're making me thinking of the difference between needing, wanting, trying to help versus getting out of the way, mm -hmm. right? So if you if you're in if you're if you're um, igniting power or allowing that power, you know, to, not getting in the way of that, that's a mm -hmm. different. How, how can we help adopt that mindset of like getting out of the way as opposed to being too controlling? Yeah, I think the first thing is when we are in communication, we take a moment to pause and say, here's what I heard you say. Is this what you meant? Did I get it right? So become that mirror and reflect back to make sure you have clarity and not assumption. Mm. And assumptions will lead to mistakes, as many, many, many of the guests um, in the series Absolutely. here. If you go back and say, well, for a lot of cases, what what was the cause of the mistake? A bad assumption mm -hmm. is, is often at, at the root of it. Um, maybe in your situation, there was this assumption in the moment that it was okay to share with the reporter, that it was okay to answer mm -hmm. those questions. But again, mm -hmm. it sounds like they kind of put you on the spot a little bit. But maybe there's a lesson learned, I guess. If it's just back to your story real briefly, like if if a reporter calls you and I guess you could always say, hey, let me take your number and call back. Right. Absolutely. Take your number, call back. Uh, start with the end in mind. If I do this, what's the ramifications? And then is it about me or is it ego? Uh, yeah. <laughs> just all of those things, you know? Yeah. yeah. So in and in, in back to the book, um, you know, you, you talk about this being, um, you know, the age of the woman. Tell, tell us about about that phrase and, and, and why that's the case. Here's why it's the age of the woman. Ninety two percent of vacation plans made by the woman. Eighty five percent of consumer purchasing made by women. Sixty two percent of car purchases made by women. In yeah. fact, the National Hockey League says that their fastest growing demographic of new fans, women. Mm -hmm. So any country, company, community that's going to be worth its salt in the future has to begin to say, how do, do, how do we do right by women mm -hmm. uh, so that we grow and can stay on the cutting edge of where things are going? Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's something uh, one of my previous guests, uh, Tom Peters, you know, a very well-known business mm -hmm. book author and, and speaker, he's been... Um, pounding that drum for a couple of decades now of, uh, you know, and, and, and I think this points to, and I was going to ask you about, um, you know, gen, the, the, the need for gender equality and representation in workplaces. Tom Peters for the longest time had said, if you don't have women on your board, if you don't have women in your product development teams, if you don't have women in your sales organization, like you're, you, you're not going to fully understand the perspectives of the women who, like you said, have so much, purchasing power. So I was I guess I wanted to ask you Simon like how would you articulate when we talk about the need for gender equality the you know the 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 balance of well it's the right thing to do it's good business it's both how how do you see that all connecting? Yeah, I think the first thing we have to start with is does your business uh, want innovation? And obviously the answer is yes. Do we have women that are part of the project teams that we are giving a hand up, not just a handout? Are we helping women um, the next time a leadership role is available that we're coaching and helping her get that role? Here's the interesting thing that everyone should know. Whenever a woman faces a problem in business and something happens, she will say, what did I do wrong? But men if something happens, we will say, what did they do wrong? Mm. And it's understanding that we've got to come alongside women and give them the confidence to know, hey, you did all that you possibly can do. Don't eternalize it and think that you're the blame for whatever happened. So how do we really begin to remove those barriers and help women level up for who the organization and the community will become long term? Mm -hmm. And, and and so when you talk about long term, it seems like part of igniting the power of women, this power that that's there uh, includes 
real efforts, um, even extra effort to to think long term and, and develop yes. women at, of, of, of all ages, not just young girls. There's so much focus now, let's say, like on uh, on STEM education and careers, mm-hmm. being inclusive and welcoming um, to girls. Um, but then I, it's, I'm, I'm guessing you know, for, for women at any stage in their career, there's still a need and an opportunity to help level up. Tell, tell, tell us more about that. Yeah, so we just got a call from a major company in Silicon Valley who has taken the book and asked us to create a e-course for men in their organization to become advocates for women, mm-hmm. allies for women. Mm-hmm. And so the first thing we share with them is number 1, you got to understand how to coach her. Mm-hmm. Coaching is not telling, it's asking, right? Yes. right? Second thing, how do you recognize her contribution? Um, some of the challenges that women say uh, happens in business is men will poach their ideas and make them make it as if it's their idea mm-hmm. when it was a woman who teed up the idea. So how do we really recognize her contribution? And then how do we champion her efforts going forward. Sometimes women don't have access to key decision-making opportunities where budgets are decided. If you have the juice and the influence, champion those women. Yeah, yeah. And so then as as, as we work on that or as a lot of people work on that, or, you know, I, I would say, you know, if, if, if men over time have created this problem, men need to be part of the solution. Yes. Um, that, that, that applies, um, you know, I think in other, you know, situations, but, um, you know, as we're, as we're trying to, uh, help level the playing field or, or, or make sure there's, there's equal, um, opportunity or making up for past, um, you know, problems in business and society, you know, there, there, there's clear benefit to women from gender equality. But one thing you write about, I wanted to ask was, you know, you say gender equality benefits everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I I don't like to think of life as a zero sum game. Um, uh, how how do, you know if somebody asks, well, how does gender equality benefit men? Like men may say, well, th- this is clearly a losing proposition for me as a man. How, how would you say that's not the case? It's not because here's the deal: women are going to make sure everyone benefits and no one is left out. So, point in case. Men, we tend to be at times linear in how we solve a problem, but women have a 360 degree degree view. They'll look at it from a ton of different angles and bring questions that were like, whoa, we didn't even think about that. That doesn't mean, guys, we lose, we gain with a different perspective. So it's just leaning in uh, and, and really understanding, you know what? That's a great, that's a great thought. I never saw it that way. Mm-hmm. So then it sounds like that, if you will, grows the pie. We're not dividing a fixed proverbial pie differently yes. with more women in leadership roles, better it's opportunity. A, for it's all. abundance over scarcity. Sure. You know, and yeah. the abundance says there's enough pie to go around for everyone. Yeah. And and so, you know, as we think of these different issues around um equality um you know we think of related words of 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 diversity and equity Mm -hmm. and inclusion in in different dimensions including gender you know a a word i will admit to not knowing uh until maybe a couple years ago is this this word intersectionality Mm -hmm. of thinking of um let's say gender and race and other um characteristics or is, is there a different is there different advice or a different support if we're talking about women of color and trying to ignite the power in them? You know what? I would say it's not really different, but what I will double click on is organizations and businesses being intentional mm-hmm. about women of color to make sure that they have access and support and opportunities just like women from the majority uh, race. Uh, and just being really intentional about it. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess just first off, recognizing or admitting that need and, and, mm-hmm. and trying to figure out then being intentional of what are we going to do as an organization? Absolutely. As you probably know, and as I've seen over the years, 30 years of working, everything in business comes down to relationships. Mm-hmm. And so many times, people of color, men and women, 
don't have relationships beyond the office. And think now, most people are working remote. If you didn't have a relationship pre the pandemic, oh my goodness, now you've got to build up a relationship. You don't have the proximity of being close to power or influencers. And then you're a minority. You're like, what the heck? Like what has just happened? So what I'm encouraging individuals to think about yeah, you got you went to the right B school, you've got all the pedigrees, but everything comes down to relationships. Mm-hmm. Double down on getting connected to people throughout the organization who can be a sponsor, who can wear your brand t-shirt and yelp about what you bring to the organization or business. Yeah. Well, our, our guest again is uh Simon T. Bailey. Uh SimonTBailey.com is the website. Um, the most recent book again, is Ignite the Power of Women. You can find more information at IgniteThePowerOfWomen.com. You know, I, I, I always love talking to authors. Um, we've, we've, we've touched on sort of, you know, the inspiration and the spark for the book. I want to talk a little bit about process. Like you, you shared with me previously that it took you, it sounds like it was quite a journey. It was three years to write the book and lots of changes. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that process of, let's say somebody wants to write and they say, well, I've got to have it all figured out before I start writing. It seems like that that might not be true. <laughs> no, literally the, the book took me three years to write 10 rewrites. So one of the things you learn is wow. you write to rewrite <laughs> the, <laughs> ju- the journey of being an author. But one of the things that I had to overcome because I go really personal and reveal a lot of things in the book, mm-hmm. uh, it was my wife, Jody who said, you really need to finish the book. So the process that I started with is I would write early in the morning and then I would just step away f- from it and then I would go back. And then over time, I kind of found my voice in the writing. Mm-hmm. And then there, I, if I wrote about 40,000 pages. Uh, I got too close to it. So I went to an editor yeah. uh, that got it down to 20,000. She said, let's cut out the pooch. Uh, 20,000 <laughs> words. You mean? Yeah, 20,000 yeah. words. Yeah, yeah right. 20,000 yeah. words. So we just cut out a lot of the fat. You're like, nope, mm-hmm. nope, nope. Let's like get right to the point. And you don't have to be a victim in your story, you know, because the story can go on and on and on and on. Mm-hmm. So part of the process was letting go of how do I ensure that I'm giving value to the reader and it's not just me living through the trauma of going through therapy and being divorced, right? Yeah. So uh, taking that process and then finally, uh, not because I'm not a licensed practitioner, I'm not a mental health counselor, I'm not a you know a person that that is a therapist. So I also have to, in my process, say this is a recommendation mm-hmm. and a reflection that is a suggestion. So that's why I say a guide. So you can opt in and decide how it works for you. So going through that process, it took us about three years because, you know, people are like, wait a minute, you're not a therapist. You know, are you a quarterback armchair therapist? Hold on. (laughs) Right. So, yeah. Um, So I'm I'm glad you you found uh, the persistence to to keep at it because writing can be frustrating at times. Uh, It's easy to to be self-critical or, you know, be afraid to put things out there. And, but boy, then once you get going, the power of an editor, right. Who can kind of cut through. There's that pride of, Hey, I wrote that. I'm like, well, mm, it's not bad. It just maybe doesn't fit. Right. The right editor has that literary, literary surgical knife that just goes through and cut. All right, we're going to cut this. <laughs> You're like, okay. And you know, writing, and this is no disrespect for uh, any women that have given birth, but writing is like giving birth, like for a man, because you just like, what is going on? <laughs> uh, at least one parallel I could I could think of um, that's less, uh, yeah. Uh, people ask, which which is your favorite book? Like, I don't I don't have any children, but it, what, what's your favorite book is a difficult question to answer if you've written multiple books. You don't want to be asked, who's your favorite child? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Is there, um, I, 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 I not put pressure on you, another book waiting to get out? Working on it right now as yeah. we speak. <laughs> right. um, yeah. What and, and that title and, and everything may, may change again. What, what's, what's the high level topic? I'm curious. The high level topic is how do you help friends? Uh, if you're not a therapist, how do you help friends face the music and truly have a reality check? and own where they are just yeah, own it yeah. yeah so good luck with uh with that project and i'm sure Thank you'll you. find the the stick i know that's not a word but that's kind of 
It's a great what word. It's a good, love it. It's a good so, uh, made up you'll, word. <laughs> you'll stick with, you'll stick with it. Um, so before we wrap up, um, another, uh, aspect of Simon's uh, work and life that's important to him is a nonprofit organization uh, called Global Servants. You can learn more at globalservants.org. Um, t- tell us about that organization. Why, why is that important to you? I love their work because in Thailand and Africa, they have committed to making sure that girls do not experience human trafficking mm. by providing education, a safe environment for them to grow and develop and to be world citizens. So I just so believe in what they're doing. So following in that theme of um, making the world a better place uh, for women. Absolutely. Definitely fits in with that theme, it seems, and your passion and your commitment to, to all of that. So thank you for for sharing you know, a, a little bit about uh, what they do and for supporting them. And I encourage people to go check out, again, uh, globalservants.org. So um, Simon, this is this has been a lot of fun. You know, I appreciate you sharing um, your, your, I was going to say your mistake story. It was mistake stories. And I appreciate as you were talking about what's helpful for others, you know, sort of taking ownership of it. What did you do? What did you learn? Really appreciate you sharing all of those reflections. And I know people will get a lot out of uh, your books. Um, so I encourage people go look for links in the show notes. Go learn more about Simon. He's uh, a powerful speaker. You can see the clips of him uh, online as well. Uh, you're, you, you're, it, as you've, I sh- think, showed to us, uh, showed us today as I'm babbling through words, you're good with a phrase. <laughs> you've, <laughs> you've, you've given us some, uh, some good phrases, um, with some real meat behind it and that serves you well on stage. So I'll encourage you to go people to go check that out as well. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Simon.